Hello, Hall H Show listeners. Aaron Nabus here, and on this episode, we welcome Emily Rocha, Travis Rivas, Scott Lost, and Lee Cozy, just a few members of the Accidental Aliens, a comic book creating group based in San Diego, California, to discuss their 2019 anthology, which has been fully funded on Kickstarter. So, congratulations to them. Their Kickstarter ends on April 1st, 2019. So, go check out the stretch goals and support some incredible indie comic book creators. I had fun talking to them about this year's creature feature theme and getting to know them a little bit more, especially Lucasfilm artist Lee Cozy, who is a new accidental alien. Thanks again to them for coming on the show, and also thanks to Bo Machado for letting us record at the Altered Ego Cafe and Hideout inside SoCal Comics. If you love our mission to be the voice of independent creators, we would love a rating and a comment on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, please share our episodes using the hashtag HallHShow. Thanks, and please enjoy my conversation with the Accidental Aliens, whose tagline is, Creators are better together. Let's keep them together so they can continue to create awesome comics and anthologies. Check out their Kickstarter and visit them at conventions. Hello, Hall H listeners. Welcome back to the podcast. It is a beautiful Sunday afternoon. It is uh, St. Patrick's Day, and we are at uh, SoCal Comics at uh, Altered Eagle Coffee. Thanks to Bo for letting us do the podcast here. Uh, he makes some mean... Uh, what is this, Bo? Is the the hazelnut coffee that you gave me? It is the uh, Loyal Sidekick. Yeah, the Loyal Sidekick, which I am today to uh, my guest, uh, the Accidental Aliens. Uh, welcome to the show. We got uh, Scott Loss. We got Emily Rocha. Travis Rivas and Lee Cozy, how you guys doing? Very well, thank you. Thank you. Good, good, good man. And uh, we're here to talk about their anthology, which they have successfully kickstarted. Congratulations! Thank you very much. Um, yes. I-, I was hoping to come on the show and give you guys extra boost, but uh, you know, we got two weeks left, so we will take all the boost that we can get. So all there's right. definitely time to back the project still. Awesome. Yeah. Well. Um, uh, both Scott, Emily, I'm sorry, both, <laughs> uh, Scott, Emily, and, and Travis have been on the show before, but, uh, for guests, uh, for our, our audience out there who's new to the show, um, could you guys introduce yourselves again and maybe give your origin story and, uh, why you fell in love with comics? Um, I'm Scott Lost, so I've been drawing comics since I was a little kid. I took a 10 year hiatus to be a pro wrestler, so I was a pro wrestler for 10 years, um, but back into comics. And uh, I've done The Second Shift, which is a creator-owned series that I still currently do. Uh, the Accidental Alien Anthologies, which I usually have The Wanderers of Melisanda, which is my second title. And uh, yeah, that's that's it. I've loved comics since I was a little kid, and so thought it'd be great to draw. Hmm. Emily? Um, uh, I have also been into comics uh, basically my whole life. Um, I got into the industry about eight years ago. Um, by doing uh, by doing cons and just making friends in the industry, and uh, that's where I met the Accidental Aliens at uh, San Diego Comic Fest. Cool, Travis. Um, yeah, kind of the same story. Where I grew up loving comics, particularly X Men: The Animated Series, is really what got me in and, and reading X Men. Um, and then uh, for your listeners out there, I was actually born with an upper limb difference, where I'm missing the radius bone in both of my arms. And when I was growing up, I didn't see any kind of superheroes who looked like me or had limb differences. So I created my own, the Unstoppable Cherub, who who, who we released through the Accidental Aliens label. And um, I'm working on another project um, related to that, which we'll talk about later. Lee. And yeah, I, uh, I just I grew up always wanting to be an animator or a, you know a storyteller, and then I discovered uh, I didn't like tweening. And then when I discovered <laughs> comics in high school, I was just kind of like, oh my god, it's just like animation, except it's you know I can tell a story with images, but not tween. Mm-hmm. So I fell in love with comics at that point. Cool. And speaking of comics, um, I mean, you're mostly known for your your paintings. That's how I know you. Mm-hmm. Um, we were talking a little bit um, before the podcast, and you were doing sequential art before. Oh yeah. You want to go that into that a little bit? Um, well, in the 90s, uh, I was in the Marine Corps, and in my spare time uh, in the barracks and whatnot, I would just make comics. 
and then eventually uh, I teamed up with some friends and you know we started out with uh, we, we partnered up with another indie company and we were doing underground comics and whatnot and then at one point uh, we kept trying to my friend Dennis and I tried publishing our own stuff through them but they were like yeah not a chance in hell so we uh, went and formed our own company Bloodfire Studios and so we published for about um, 15 years as Bloodfire Studios and and then as Allegory Media after that uh, because when we tried to go a little more commercial, they uh, they informed us that Bloodfire might be a creepy name for people. So <laughs> it's like you should come up with a more audience friendly name. So yeah, we published um, uh, we published other people's books too, which was kind of cool when we tried to expand. So it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> since we're since the Holly Show, we 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 pride ourselves in, in being able to support independent creators out there. Um, you said before the show that you had sort of worked on mainstream stuff to help support uh, indie comics and your, your your passion for indie comics. Yeah. So you want to maybe go into that a little bit, and then I'll, I'll go to back to Travis first. Well, I loved. Uh, I have I have two big loves. Is one I love telling stories. I love you know that idea of visual narrative or narrative art. Um, and uh, I also love paying all my bills. Uh, the two, <laughs> as an indie creator, don't always go along. You can so do both. <laughs> you well, you can, but it's it's like it's like kind of like, kind of like being a rock band. Oh. It's like you know only a few actually make it to the point where they're doing it full time. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just kind of hit a point where I really wanted to do the comic books, but uh, I couldn't do that. I couldn't devote the amount of time I needed to the comic books and then to also do like, you know, I was doing design work for like Nike and Verizon and Microsoft and all these big companies. Small time. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as a designer. And, uh, so I actually, uh, when Verizon first launched, when GTE and Bell Atlantic merged, uh, I was actually one of the designers. I was the senior artist on Verizon.net. So I oh, actually wow. designed, you know, uh, a lot of stuff for Verizon Wireless. Uh, they had me doing all the photo editing for them when they found out I could digitally paint photorealistically. So, so how do you go from that to meeting George Lucas? He um, was drawing uh, dicks in the background, and, <laughs> but they were alien shaped, and they were super into it. And he's just like, "Oh man, this guy gets me." Goes, Can you hear me now? And it wasn't really an antenna. <laughs> Sorry. No, it was. Uh, that was his third passion. <laughs> um, I drew a picture of Gandalf. It's pretty much what it comes down to. Uh-huh. It's what I like to tell people is that you, if you're, when I'm teaching, one of the things I tell people is if you are the next Michelangelo, if you're not showing your work, if you're not out there, you know, nobody's going to know that you're good or that you're capable of doing this and they're not going to hire you. So you have to go and do shows and promote yourself. And that's kind of where the, 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 the mesh came from is I was actually, uh, we were doing Kindergoth. Uh, we were signing at San Diego Comic-Con. And uh, I had drawn a, they had announced Ian McClellan was going to be Gandalf. So I did a fan art picture of Ian McClellan. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, I really love this. So I framed it and I stuck it on the end. And I draw very photorealistically. Kindergoth is a cartoon book. It's just super deformed and silly. And it's about aliens who get stoned on pork rinds. It's it's all kinds of weird stuff. I need to see this. Um, I should have brought copies. But um, uh, but yeah, it's just all kinds of like weird, very much Animaniacs, Monty Python kind of inspired humor. And then, um, uh, but yeah, somebody, we, we, when we launched the book here in San Diego, I'm from San Diego. So we invited all of our friends. It's like, Hey, our book's coming out. And the, the, my friend Dennis, who was the co-publisher, uh, he graduated from SDSU and grew up in La Jolla. So he was just like, yeah, you know, we've got this new book coming out. So let's just, everybody come down. We'll make a big line. It'll look impressive. And it was funny because you had that line mentality took over. And so suddenly people started waiting in line who weren't people we knew because they were just curious, what's this line for? Yeah, it happens all. People just start waiting in line for stuff. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. Yeah. But it, I, we, we witnessed it firsthand there. And it was just all originally it was just all our friends, you know, standing in line. Yeah. And then suddenly all these new people are in there. And then even Diamond got in line because they were trying <laughs> to figure out, like, what is this company we're not distributing selling that's got this huge line? Very cool. Note and, for this, uh, this Comic-Con when we have our table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just make all your friends line up. But yeah, right. so so uh, uh, one of the guys in line was an art director uh, for Tops, and they had just bought the license for uh, the Lord of the Rings movies. So they asked me if I would work on some of their licensing material. So they brought me on to work on Lord of the Rings. And then I worked on Lord of the Rings, Two Towers, Return of the King. And then after that, uh, another company saw my Lord of the Rings work, hired me to work on Shrek. And then while I was up at Shrek, uh, or up at the DreamWorks studios up in LA, uh, Burbank, I believe, uh, you have to, every time you walk through doors, 
there, you have to sign in on a new logbook. And somebody else I had worked with on Lord of the Rings saw my stuff and said, oh, this guy would be good for our new project, which turned out to be Indiana Jones. Mm. And then after Indiana Jones, one day I just got a package that said, yeah, you're now working on Clone Wars, the animated movie. And I was like, no, no, I got rejected for Star Wars. Because I, I had just applied like a few months before to try and do something for Star Wars. And they said, no, you don't understand. You worked on Indiana Jones. To be a Lucasfilm artist back then, before Disney, George Lucas handpicked every artist. And if he said, yeah, he can work on Indiana Jones, it basically means you can work on anything George does. And so that's kind of how that ended up. Is just one day I just accidentally, you know, no, no pun intended, <laughs> uh, accidentally ended up working on Star Wars. And so that's how the whole George Lucas thing came about. Cool. So those were accidental aliens then, huh? Yeah. <laughs> And that became intentional. <laughs> so they started out as wizards and orcs yeah. and then archaeologists. So, so how did awesome. it work out? Um, did you approach the aliens here to, to maybe... No, dude. He worked on Star Wars. <laughs> 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 not approaching us. What? No, it was... Uh, we, so uh, so uh, this coffee shop, fantastic, uh, Alter Ego, it's in, located in SoCal Comics in Kearney Mesa in Claremont. And... Um, and we, I, they have events here fairly regularly, every couple of, you know, like every quarter or so. And so like free comic book day is a huge one. And so Jamie, the owner, would always invite me out and say, hey, I want you to set up a big art display and show the paintings you do that you can't take to most of the shows because Artist Alley is tiny. So he gives me a big space and I would put paintings and stuff up. And so I met these guys just hanging out. And then one day Travis, you know, like... I think it was WonderCon last year WonderCon when I first like approached you. Yeah, because we we we'd also seen you at uh, San Diego Comic Fest a lot, um, and we. I think we, it was WonderCon. Mm -hmm. I think I remember you coming back to the table. Yeah. Um, so I'll usually work WonderCon and Travis. Travis and uh, my my writer, uh, they'll both help me help me on the table, and so he took off and he came back. He's like, "Dude, Lee's in." I was like, no way. Serious? Yeah. He goes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he just it. came up and was like, hey, would you like to do an anthology? We got this, you know, for one of the alien books. It's, you know, it's it's totally independent. It's, you know, this, this, this. And I don't even think you finished the page. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> and it's, it's because, I, again, I grew up doing, you know, comics on Xerox machines and stuff. So I love that. Well, even before that, um, you know, Scott and I, we're always kind of thinking ahead. We're always trying to plan our next anthology. And, and we had talked about, you know, okay, where can we go after after the 2018? And and uh, another writer, Terry Mayo, was interested. And um, Lee's name came up, and I'm like, yeah, that'd be really really cool. You know, he's got a really cool style. He's got the Star Wars stuff. And we just kind of talked about it a little bit, and I was like, hey, you know, maybe I'll go ask him and see if he's interested. And and clearly he was, and, um, and that's where we're at now. Awesome. Um Maybe we can go into the book, the story, the individual stories a little bit. I know you're not writing one. You didn't write one this year. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm, I didn't write one of them. I'm focusing on another project, um, but I'm still um, part of the studio. I'm still trying to get the word out there. Um, still, still here. Still. Yeah, he's all up in the mix. He's our so, man on the street right now. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah, no, no. Travis is, you know, definitely... Um, he did, wasn't able to complete a story for this year's and he'll more than likely be back in the next year, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So, but we have a, another project in the works that Travis is, is heading. And then I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that a bit. Yeah. Uh, but for, for this year's anthology, we wanted to do a creature feature. Um, our first two were kind of like, whatever you want, whatever you guys feel like doing. Like I didn't, like I didn't want to be censored on what I was doing or, or dictating the pace for anyone else. And so the first two was very like, whatever you feel like working on, do it. So we actually had a nice variety of, of stories to choose from in the first two anthologies. And we thought maybe we can draw more attention when it's a, a focused uh, theme. So we're like, let's, you know, let's do creature feature. Like it's kind of, kind of narrows the scope a bit, but it still allows you to work in the realm of like classic, classic monsters or aliens those still count as creatures you can still go the sci-fi route you can go the fantasy route so but it's just slightly directing us to you know to a goal and so we were hoping that might attract people online as well like on kickstarter like if people are specifically into monsters mm -hmm. they'll look for this project um so you just tried something different for this year so everyone's projects have uh, creatures in it in some way or form cool um do you want to say something Oh, okay. Um, your, yours is a second shift 6.5. So I, I guess it's like a sort of a prequel to 
Uh, it is a prequel to the seventh issue, the seventh issue of the second shift. The the team take on a kaiju that's running through downtown San Diego. And um, usually when I think of characters, I'll think of their backstory. And so I had a backstory in mind for this kaiju. And I was like, that will go perfect with this. And usually I do my other series, The Wanderers of Melisande. But I was like, this will be a nice crossover story where it'll bring some of the second shift audience to the anthology and vice versa. So people that normally get the anthology will be like, hey, what's this? What's the second shift? And you know, maybe they'll see the 6.5 and you know, seek out the rest of the issues and vice versa. And uh, it just fit. And so the Wanderers actually do in like zippa tones, black and white. And I thought, since it's an old school, you know, kaiju story, like origin story, it might look cool in that same style. Um, so, and it, like, I think it's coming out really well. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. So it's just a crossover, the origin of that kaiju, and then how they, it ended up in downtown San Diego. Cool. Emily, yours is called Golem. You yes. want to tell us a little bit about, about your story? Sure. Um, I wanted to do a story that was uh, mostly um, illustration and not really dialogue driven because um, I, my first anthology story was written by Travis. It was great. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, the second anthology story I wrote myself and I wasn't really, I didn't really have a dialogue driven uh, story in mind for this year. So um, what I did was I just wanted to do a story that worked really well without any verbal um, verbal communication. And then at the end, depending on uh, where my deadline was, I would uh, put a poem on top of it. Um, and so I, I designed it so that e it would either be like no words at all or the poem. And uh, I ended up uh, doing the poem, which I'm not much of a poet, but <laughs> I, but uh, it was really, um, I drew a lot of inspiration from uh, storybooks that I've had for years and years and uh, some comics that were, um, that were written a little more poetically than with, you know, person to person dialogue. Um, and so it, there's no, there's no big spoiler to my story. It's basically a woman um, who's standing over a city and then you infer from the visuals that she like was once like a slave of the king of that city. And so it's a story of her just like utilizing this great power to take revenge and the poem covers like revenge and anger and, uh, and which has control either you or your, uh, or your revenge. Cool. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Lee, um, yours is called uh, Omicron Fell. So uh, when we were publishing Bloodfire, mm -hmm. um, my friend Dennis and I got together and we started creating uh, a book that was originally called Citadels. And that was Dennis's idea initially. And then uh, we both sat down, developed our own stuff independently. But then when the company, you know, changed to Allegory and we started doing other stuff, so we actually, you know, licensed like Speed Racer and stuff like that. So oh, we wow. started doing like major publication projects. Um, there really wasn't a home for the Citadels project. So uh, I, over the years, retooled it a little bit uh, for uh, taking the stuff that I created for that and retooling it so that it could be a story in itself. And um, so the world is actually called Omicron Fell. So you can almost think of it as, you know, it's Star Wars and then... You know, this is just like, you know, episode three. So it's just it's, it's something that takes place within that uh, uh, within that store, that overall world of Omicron fell. Mm -hmm. Travis, do you you haven't you didn't contribute this time, but um, do, are you familiar with the other uh, people's stories? Uh, yeah, um, we have um, several other stories. One of them. Um, is a sequel to A Tale of Rust by Dylan Gray. A uh, Tale of Rust was a story in our 2018 anthology. Um, and so he's continuing the story with that. Um, so in the Tale of Rust world, there's lots of uh, different creatures, um, kind of animal cyborg hybrid creatures. Um, and it's, it's, there's a magic versus technology uh, theme in there. Uh, as well. Um, and then um, another one of our stories is by Andy Duclith, and her story is um, what's it? The Serena Cliffs. Ser Serena yeah. Cliffs. Um, it's all about um, Andy. If you know Andy, she works in the news media and um, she covers, a lot of times she covers stories about people who need to be rescued from the beach, and it seems that someone's always down at Sunset Cliffs getting trapped. <laughs> and mm -hmm. And so she she wrote a creature theme story based around that. Um, we also have draw hard, draw hard. Yeah, Scott, remind me more of this story. Draw cause... hard. Uh, so he he did it's bones, bugs, and harming me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's the name on the front of the comic. So the 
the the theme of that is it's a found comic like you would find in a um, like a discount store or something like that just like a, a indie book that no one's ever heard of and then that has had a lot of life in it like kids have drawn on it like blacked out teeth and eyes or whatever and um so it has a really cool looking style to it and then but it's a horror story within this old comic that people have drawn on top of so it's a really cool idea he's always thinking of really innovative ways to to put his stories out just to be different from everybody else so it has a very very old school look to it it looks it looks pretty cool um and then we mentioned earlier terry mayo who uh from the wicked and the righteous by alterna is doing a story with us called the head of state and it's a clever title. Yeah. Um, and it's all about um, in the post-zombie apocalypse war, there's a young woman who finds a, a literal talking head in the capital. Um, and their plan to kind of um, make make the zombie world great again. <laughs> <laughs> this is a tagline. Yeah. It's, it's, it's clever. Uh, I guess Terry is up in uh, Emerald City Comic Con right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was mm-hmm. over there over the weekend. He made it. Uh, back to San Diego, but uh, just time wise, it didn't make sense. So huh. He couldn't make it here, but he's he's back in town. But yeah, he was up there for that. Terry's a family man. He's got yeah. a lot. He has lot like of thirteen kids. kids. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's what that's basically what he based uh, Wicked and the Righteous on was his kids and how they would, you know, fair and. I think it's more school. like seven kids, not thirteen. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was it like uh, working with Terry? Uh, Terry's great. Um, Terry is always coming up with really cool ideas. Um, you know, some of the events that Lee mentioned earlier about here at SoCal Comics, we always would see him and joke around and, and, uh, we'd read Wicked and the Righteous and we're like, this is a really cool, cool story, a really cool idea. And, uh, we just kind of asked him like, Hey man, do you have anything else? Cause we like you and, uh, we want to see you in this book. And he's like, I actually, I do have this story. Uh, and the way that he tells it, he actually wrote it 20 years ago. Um, during the Clinton scandal and impeachment and all that. And it's really all about how um, the, the kind of ridiculous, over-the-top nature of, of, of Washington. Um, and, you know, Terry's, Terry's a professional guy. You know, he always uh, got his, his stuff in there. He's always ready to, to help out. And, um, yeah, it, yeah, working with him is great. I would, you des- the- would you describe the uh, head of state as kind of like a post-apocalyptic view of partisan politics? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the joys of partisan politics in a post-apocalyptic yeah. world. Where, where we're going to lead to if uh, we don't get our stuff together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I actually remember the one of the first SoCal signing events that we did. Um, that's where I met Terry. He was actually in the spot next to us. And uh, he was like a completely separate table. But he was just like, hey um, – you guys are accidental aliens. I was like, yeah. And he goes, oh, I bought this. And he pulled out the 2017 book. And I was all, oh, where'd you, where'd you get that? He goes, oh, I bought it at, um, I forgot what store he bought it at. 138? It might have been at 138. So he actually had picked up our book before we had even met him. And so that was super cool. He's like, do you guys mind signing it? I'm like, of course we'll sign it for you. I'm like, oh, that was super cool. He's like, hey, are you guys looking for anyone right now? But I think we had already, I think we were already, uh, might have been, in the process of finishing up the 2018 so i told him uh, at the moment we weren't but then we would see him at more more events and he was just like super down to earth i actually got to read his stuff because that happens a lot surprisingly um we'll meet new creators and they'll be like can we be can i be in your book and i'm like well i don't, I don't know anything about you and mm-hmm. so um from the time i met him to you know to the next anthology i actually got to read his work and i was like oh this is really good like this he would definitely be cool to like be in the group so yeah, like Travis said, he's great. <laughs> Very easy to work with, too. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, As opposed to that bastard Lee. That's right. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it out loud, but he's... <laughs> you know, he's big time in Hollywood. He's yeah. got big old ego. His small and projects. <laughs> <laughs> I think he has a bit of a nose candy problem. For yeah. Little <laughs> Speed racer. It's, it's, not, it's not allergies. It's a habit. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lifestyle. Uh, you mentioned uh, signing events, and one big... Uh, someone who's a big proponent of the sunny events is uh, chad kavanaugh i just want to send a quick shout out to chad I what up chad i know he's uh, taking care of his pops right now mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. big left to him um we should get chad on the anthology one of these days <laughs> yeah he's, he's always doing all of his own stuff yeah. it's like hard to gauge just the interest there 
I just poke him and say, you've got a year, just do seven pages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he always seems like he's really interested in keeping everything under his own brand and his own title. Yeah, which not, is, wouldn't hurt to yeah. see what's up. Yeah. Um, maybe we can go a little bit into each of your sort of uh, process and coming up with ideas, because I think that'd be pretty insightful for some of our audiences who are trying to come up with their own uh, comic books or short stories. Um, Lee, uh, do you have any insight in that? Um, well, it's uh, for me, it's um, when I'm doing my own stuff, it's essentially I look at the world that it takes place in. So that's like Omicron Fell um, isn't the name of the book. i is actually the name of the book um, that I'm doing for Accidental Aliens. And uh, what I would do is I would just create a world. It's like, what is this world like? How did it get that way? And then I'd create the backstory for the world. And then I go, okay, now I need to pick characters I'll, you know, within this world. It's like, okay, well, there's a baker because somebody's going to make bread, you know, something like that. Or I'll just come up with a character. In this case, it's military. So it's uh, salvage teams. So the world has this very post-apocalyptic kind of... Uh, uh, don't fall. <laughs> <laughs> Travis just fell out of his chair. <laughs> Oh yeah, cracks. Travis falling down. <laughs> I was trying to record an Insta story. <laughs> there you go. I'll just start from the beginning and make it easy for the edit. <laughs> I, I still need to start doing those Insta stories. What we should then. do is if you're filming it, we'll trade still seats. <laughs> we'll all trade seats so that when the edit oh. cuts, it's no longer <laughs> seamless. Yeah. Just yeah. like, wait, wait, what, what happened? Trained. What happened? Magic. <laughs> I am. Thank you. <laughs> what are you? A Filipino and white. Okay. Yeah. What do I so half and half? What does white What does white mean? Like Irish, uh, <clears throat> European? Um, as for me, <laughs> I think I think it's German. I think my white side's German. My mom's Scottish Irish. Mexican and French. Oh. So I'm I'm of Norwegian descent. So <laughs> that's the blonde hair and the height, but uh, and broad shoulders. So Viking. Uh, my beard, however, is evidently Irish. It's a rape and pillage beard. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> so it was. Uh, it, it came about just simply because you know the Vikings like to visit new lands. <laughs> visit. <laughs> Air quotes. Yeah, I got I got ripped off. My dad's like six four or something. Oh, oh but he had a short wife. Oh, my Aww. my mom is like <clears throat> five. That's it. Five. But see, it could have been worse, though. It like, could have been your worse. Your dad yeah. could be 6'4", your mom could be 6'2", and you came at 5'2". Yeah, and you're like, like, what? I got Danny DeVito'd. I, I, got, actually, um, yeah. I left out taller than my parents. <laughs> Danny DeVito. My uh, grandpa's super tall, and it skipped a generation. So my mom and my dad are both like really short, and I'm like about this much taller than them. Mm. <laughs> it's a good thing you don't like to do something that's like tall-related, like playing basketball right. or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, oh yeah. Speaking of basketball, you, you play, or you used to play a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the doctor recommends that I... Don't. Because <laughs> I destroyed my knee uh, wrestling. My right knee's destroyed and my left ankle's destroyed. Uh, my left ankle's destroyed from basketball. Like, it, people yeah. run over me and I roll my ankle. All my injuries have come from basketball. Yeah. So, yeah, the doctor's like, you shouldn't play this anymore. And I'm all, well, because I have heel what spurs. I did? And uh, he's like, you shouldn't be playing high impact sports, stuff like that. If I did surgery, you basically wouldn't be able to play sports again. I'm like, okay, well, that's out then. And I'm like, so what do I need to do to play basketball? He goes, I don't re recommend you do that at all. And I was like, but Which what? I need to play basketball. Right. I'm like, sit on the bench. Yeah. But what <laughs> if I did play basketball? What do you recommend? He's like, okay, you need to get heel lifts. Don't take ibuprofen mm. before, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, well, I'll just cut it down from twice a week to twice a month. You actually said don't take like, ibuprofen? Not before. No, okay. you, need, you need to change your <laughs> pain receptors. You need, because ibuprofen oh, dulls oh, you feeling the pain. Mm -hmm. So you need the pain receptors to let you know you're pushing it too hard. You better chill out. Mm -hmm. So um, he's like, if you do take it afterwards, Ice elevate that type of stuff. No, I just remember one of my uh, dentists actually the uh, with uh, yeah, Bloodfire Studios. Oh, okay. Uh, he's a kinesiologist, so oh. he's actually head trainer for the U.S. Rug national rugby team. Oh, oh wow! Nice. There, there was a time where they were just all like, you know, it's like, oh, you feeling bad here? Just cram this ibuprofen down your throat. <laughs> yeah, don't play. I mean, have fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's also at a professional level. Those guys. They have to perform no matter what. Yeah. So. Football. Get, get yeah. the quarters shot. Rugby, and just rugby go. And football players. Yeah. For sure, I, I learned I learned all the uh, the I medical guys' dirty there. tricks. <laughs> Just eat the cookie. Just eat it. No, he's yeah. like, like right now. You're not the it, boss of me. Ooh, <laughs> you're not the boss. Tell me what to do. He is your editor. 
He's not my boss. <laughs> I made that clear to her because she said that to me. It's yeah. creator. When own. I hire you as my nutritionist, you can bitch with me all you want. You're not my supervisor. We're at, we're at uh, Andy's um, celebration for a new job or something, uh, mm-hmm. leaving the old place. You're doing something. And I said something. You're like, sure I was doing something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, no. I'm on like, the Colombian diet. You're like, technically you're my boss, God, but fuck you. I'm not doing that. I'm, all, I'm not your boss. I'm saying that. <laughs> Just come out, pretend to be drunk. You know, so I'm like, I am not doing that. You yeah, call I, that I, a raise? I don't think she was pretending that day. Uh, <laughs> she gets drunk pretty easily, which is super cool. <laughs> Cheap. Yeah, beat? it is super yeah, cool. Yeah, no, it oh. takes me forever. It's very inexpensive. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. I'm just, it's a struggle. I'm like, come on, beer nine. Be the one. Be the one. Be the one. <laughs> we were doing uh, the Accidental Aliens podcast um, named... Uh, Probing conversations, uh, and uh, that's the name of the podcast. Yeah, yeah. okay. Probing conversations oh, <laughs> with the accidental aliens. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm th- um, well I, the worst thing was is I was sitting there thinking like you know, uh, pap smear, colonoscopy, <laughs> <laughs> angioplasty. Uh, we wanted something related to the accidental aliens, so we're like, well, what's you know, abduction, probing. Yeah. Oh, probing conversation. That's you know, that's <laughs> so it works. Um, but yeah, so I was like, I'm gonna need to get there because like, I like to be loose. I'm doing podcasts and stuff, so we were, we had some spirits, we had some whiskey, mm. whiskey and cokes. So I just caffeinate. Good. Yeah, that's another way to go. Yeah, <laughs> but I I definitely wanted to sleep afterwards. So. <laughs> oh, I wanted to work afterwards. Oh, <laughs> I just don't sleep. Yeah, yeah. I got I think I got solid four that night. That's all the human body needs. Totally. Yeah. Four just hours. Just four, four hours a week. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> so sure, why not? There, there was actually uh, you owe me a beer. Uh, yep. there was this one time at <laughs> yep. Verizon where I had to turn in my my time cards hourly or uh, well, weekly, and I turned in my time cards and it was 104 hours. Oh, yeah. mm. And it was funny because the uh, uh, Volt was the company, the temp agency or whatever. So they came back and they're just like, oh, you know, we need to verify two things. One is, uh, did Lee Cozy in fact work 104 hours? And the art director's like, oh yeah, he did. <laughs> like, I, I essentially had like a, a pillow under my desk. And so I would work <laughs> and then I would submit something to somebody for review and I would just take a, a quick nap. That's awesome. 45 minutes later, now. somebody would come along and kick me and said, the project's back, get up, <laughs> oh, work wow. on it. <laughs> Send it off for review, go crashing. And then I did that. And so I didn't leave the office for like a week. So That's we were insane. like, I was running down to Ross wow. to buy new clothes. and. Ross. I, I used to work at Ross Dress for a little bit. Well, yeah, there was a, well, there was a Ross down the street. So I just rushed at, run down there. And plus, I was throwing most of the clothes away afterwards. They smelled horrible. <laughs> um, you know, so I was like sponge bathing in the restroom. <laughs> That's how I do well, most my underwear. Oh. Just, just a one time use. So, oh, there you issue, go. Right? I thought you were like sponge bashing. Like, sponge washing in a public restroom. Yeah. yeah. Um, you should walk in there. He's got his butt. But yeah, the, then, they're, then they're like, water on it. They're like excuse not, me, <laughs> sir. That's not a sink, it's a bidet. <laughs> I said good day. Yeah. <laughs> Anything is a bidet if you try hard enough. Yeah. It is. If, you, if your aim is good yeah. um, or if you're flexible enough. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was just kind of funny because when we did that, it was. Huh? No. No. Oh, yeah, guys you're good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, hey, it was you're a, letting then us. Then they're like, second question. Yeah. Now that we've confirmed he did work 104 hours, is do we need to send flowers somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> like, is he still alive? <laughs> We'd like him to keep working. <laughs> it's good. It's good to set goals. I will. I was like, dang, I thought I worked hard. My goal is to not work 104 hours a weekend again. <laughs> so. What What are you at right now? I don't keep track anymore <laughs> because I'm pretty sure it's more than 104 hours. <laughs> like right now with this deadline, plus I just signed another comic project, so I've got another 75 pages of books I got to work on, mm. uh, and they want that ASAP. So, but they want them painted too. So, whoa. Uh, so I'm trying to crunch to get that done. I'd like to try and get all of it wrapped up in less than three months if I can, preferably mm-hmm. two. Uh, I'm just going to eat it all but, and teach you a lesson. Uh, but yeah, it, it basically me means that I'm, yeah. I'm working about 16 <laughs> hours a day, <laughs> sometimes 20. Correct. Wow. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to get out like every once in a while. So I'll get out for like, they have a thing here in San Diego called sketch party. Your nose in this oh yeah. So we'll get out, draw all over <laughs> tables <laughs> or whatever. And I'll go home and work <laughs> the table. cookies gone. You know, oh, or, okay. She ate it. You know, uh, <laughs> Or like last night, a bunch of Twitch guys, uh, a bunch of local Twitch streamers got together and we did a uh, St. Patrick's Day bar crawl. Oh, and since oh, I don't, I don't, since that's I, awesome. that's, the, that's my other secret, by the way, is I don't drink. So oh, okay. that, that means I can actually 
you know, wake up fresh. And <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm an all day person. Like I'll sleep at 2 p.m., uh-huh. wake up at 4 and go right back to work. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'll actually power nap like 15 minutes and then go right back to work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Mine's like that, but I have a day job. Yeah. So I usually work until... My, well, day, job, I was, my day job is power napping to finish the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll wake up at 5.30, work my day job until, until 6. I'll get home, cook dinner, and then work mm-hmm. throughout the night on art-related stuff. And go to sleep, do it all over again. It's almost like working a second shift or something. Yeah. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. What is your day job? Work for the government. It's data entry. Paper I was going to say, well, that was vague. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like I Sometimes screw like, heads on top of this. He could tell at, you, but he'd have to kill you. He likes to be vague. It makes him feel cool. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, usually at, usually at a I work for the government. Like, international spy. Usually at, at conventions, I do just leave it at that. I work for the government. Oh, doing what? You don't need to know. Yeah. <laughs> just you know what you do uh, less, less is him. more in that instance yeah. Yeah. one of my friends actually would walk around in a black suit and people asked him like what's you know it's like so what do you do he go in their card and all it says is the, it's the MIB logo <laughs> <laughs> nothing else on the card you just he, give him that he should just get a black card that just says don't ask on it <laughs> <laughs> you flip it over <laughs> government employee <Yeah. laughs> don't <laughs> Something's trying to escape from this. I told him he needs to let them out once in a while. Just to (laughs) let them stretch their little legs. I think what you need is like a little sign that goes across that says, uh, don't release. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Don't look inside. I like that even better. Just, oh, we could totally just like get one of those animatronic eyeballs. Just (laughs) crack it like a a shipping crate. (laughs) And just have like this. Every time that thumping noise, we can just have it animate. She can put a clapper in it. It turns it on every time there's thumps. (laughs) <laughs> you gotta let out. You gotta yeah, just breathing. A little breathing. <laughs> All right, you guys are good. Hey. Awesome. Right Thank you so much. <clears throat> so you want to start from top? What was the question again? All right, starting <laughs> over. Yes. Completely. Cool. All right, ready? Oh, yeah. Hey, Lee. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to know about uh, your creative process. How, how do you come up with stories? Because I think our audience would uh, gain a lot of insight there. Um, for me, uh, usually what I do is I create the world. So, uh, like with Omicron Fell, it's uh, the book I'm doing for uh, Axel Alien is actually called Icor, but the world is called Omicron Fell. And so the idea was I would create, you know, a situation. It's like, well, how the world get in this situation? Okay, well, this event happened. So in my world, the Omicron Fell is actually an event, and it's basically think of it as like you know. Uh, kind of like the whole BCAD changeover, you know, BCE, uh, you know, uh, BC changeover kind of thing before uh, for the calendar change. So it's kind of along that line. So there was this, this massive cataclysmic event that essentially is a giant reset button for the world. And so everybody's trying to recover as much of the technology as possible. And so I'll start thinking, it's like, okay, well, what kind of jobs, you know, what kind of characters or whatnot would exist in this world? And then I would pick certain characters. So, you know, I, I might pick somebody who's like a, you know, just like somebody who's like a gardener it's like well, okay well if there's not much plant life anymore what would he do like how would he how would he adapt or what would he go to um so in this case it was i had a team of people uh in i who are uh they're basically a recovery team they just go around and salvage old technology so they can't build new technology per se the the ability to do that is very limited it's just barely starting to come back online so mm-hmm. for hundreds of years people have just essentially salvaged old tech so if they find a gun they ne- can't necessarily, they may not have the knowledge to make the ammunition. Somebody else may. And, you know, if they ever meet up, cool, they now, they now become feudal lords. Mm. So you have the guy has, one guy has a supply of weapons, the other guy has a supply or knows how to repair weapons, the other guy knows how to make ammo. They're not best buddies, they're not running things. So mm. it's, a, so what kind of, you know, scenarios would start to pop up? So I usually do that. I'll create a world, a backstory for it. And I may not always tell the full backstory. But I like having that backstory so that I don't contradict myself later. So mm, that it's yeah. to me that's critical. Is I hate watching. Um, we kind of like a bunch of my friends uh, from Lucasfilm. We kind of refer to it as uh, uh, blowing up Vulcan. Mm. So you know, with uh, like with Star Trek, you had the issue of when J.J. Abrams took over Star Trek. Well, they can't contradict a bunch of stuff that happened in the TV show. They didn't want to do stuff that happened in, in the multiple TV shows, stuff like that. Plus, you're doing a prequel. What can we do to fix this? Ah, well, time travel. Mm-hmm. So we'll just blow up Vulcan, and that's now our new starting point. So what happens in a world if Vulcan blows up? So uh, so we'll do something like that where we'll take those characters and establish a new timeline. And so rather than, uh, uh, like, my creative process is essentially, you know, try to create a world and then tell individual stories within that. And so I have 
a lot <laughs> of stories <laughs> that uh, take place within Omicron Fell. That's great. Cool. That's, That's awesome. a good thing. Travis. Um, so my creative process is I just kind of, uh, I'm, I have certain interests, things that I like. Um, I like superheroes. Um, I really am trying to advocate for more uh, representation of disabilities and limb differences, specifically in superhero comics. Um, you know, so for example, when you have a character like the Winter Soldier, the Winter Soldier is a wartime amputee, but nobody would really know because he has his metallic arm. Um, and if you ever talk to uh, someone who is an amputee and uses a prosthetic, those things can be very uncomfortable. And you never see um, Winter Soldier living his life without the cybernetic arm. So he looks very able-bodied with it. So I try to find ways in which I can show living disabled and being a superhero at the same time. Um, so that's part of the reason why I created my character, the Unstoppable Cherub. Um, so when she looks like a superhero, she looks um, like I like my arms do. Um, and the, the project that I'm working on now for the the other project, the reason why I'm not in the creature feature, it's called the Chimpanchines. So I'm a, I really, really enjoy, um, well, I guess I should say enjoy. Apes are some of my favorite animals. Um, <laughs> How do you enjoy them, Travis? <laughs> I like going to the zoo. I was going to say, this walking. podcast just took a real turn yeah. for dark. And I'm like, oh. It's like, I really love Now apes. we definitely have oh, to put the explicit yeah. tag on yeah. there. How do I get one of them? Yeah. <laughs> and... Let's do that again. No, <laughs> you're rolling, man. Yeah. So much uh, like Travis with apes. <laughs> apes are one of my favorite animals. Um, I like I like to, to see superheroes who are uh, ape related, um, and so the chimpanzees are all they're cyborg apes. I'm not gonna recover this on my. I don't, it's fine. I'm just I'm just thinking you really like the umbrella cat. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, I do. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, but they they are apes with cybernetics and prosthetics, and it's a whole team of them. So I got to combine um, some of the things that I like there and tell a new story. Uh, and Scott actually kind of is the one who came up with the title. Um, there was originally going to be microchimps, um, but he said chimpanzees. I'm like, ah, oh, that's so good. And I, I really liked um, uh, the the idea of it. And he was asking me about designs and stuff like that, and like how much would I charge and all that. And I'm all tell you what, I will design them for free, but I get a percentage when this thing takes off. I'm like, your, your indie money is your indie money. I'm not going to touch that. But if this gets licensed for a, a cartoon or something, yeah, I'm getting a percentage of that. <laughs> and he's like, cool. And I'm all dope. All right, no problem. I will design that for free. And uh, yeah, and the great keep designs. it moving. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. Remember, email is a written contract. Yep. <laughs> I think we have those texts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, very, very cool story. I really like. I really like what uh, he's doing with it. It looks really cool looking. Cool. And he's uh, using the artist, uh, the same artist that he does with Unstoppable yep. Cherub, uh, Mauricio Campatella. Oh, Emily, how's your creative process? Uh, my creative process has definitely changed over the last several months. Um, I, uh, I recently went freelance about uh, eight or nine months ago, 10 months ago. I haven't kept track of the time. But <laughs> <laughs> you lose um, track. Yeah, Yeah. My, my creative process before that was very, it was very media driven. Um, I have a lot of books that I reference. I, I usually um, cross-reference like a lot of my favorite uh, Marvel, Marvel books and independent books to, uh, to really gain inspiration. But uh, recently I just haven't, I haven't had enough time to really like pursue like rabbit holes of like really good reading um and i've been doing so many freelance projects that uh my creative process especially for this book was just like finding finding like a quiet space <laughs> so i would leave my studio i would uh i would uh leave my uh leave my like little comfort zone where i get all my work done and um just take a lot of time like just take a lot of time on the road to to really think about it and so um a lot of personal stuff in my life really like wanted me to write a story, uh, a story about anger, a story about revenge, and um, it just it, this project was really just like uh, I really wanted to make a nice six-page like eye candy story, but um, but it ended up being a little more personal for me, and um, yeah. So my creative process is ever evolving, <laughs> as it should be, <laughs> Scott. Uh, now, do you do you mean more on like the process itself or like? 
creating, coming up with stories or like how I get them done or a bit of both? You can touch on both. Oh, okay. Um, so, so I usually work on two books, The Second Shift, which I created in seventh grade. Like I created these characters a long time ago. As the years have gone on, uh, the characters change as I change and the focus of the story changes. Um, so I've had quite a few characters that I create over the years, villains, that I wanted to do. So right now we're in the process. This this is, a, I just released issue eight. So we're going on to issue nine and 10. And so there's probably about three more villains that we want to introduce and then we're going to start mixing it up a bit. And um, so it's really going through those old ideas that me and my writer have had over the years and you know putting those into place. Um, as far as the creative process goes, um, I'm developing a new method to draw, like to speed everything up. So. Um, with the end of issue eight, I realized that I would just be much quicker sticking to full digital uh, and then kind of because what I was doing before I was sketching, sketching on my iPad, uh, printing it out in blue line and then inking traditionally. Mm -hmm. And I found that like it ate up so many hours that I didn't need to eat up. And it's like, well, I don't need to do this because I can get clean lines with digitally and it'll it'll save me multiple hours. So like I'm just going to go that route in the future. And so um I'm going to do that with the cover and like splash pages and stuff and uh, make sure, you know, I'm getting those, sorry, taking photos up in here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to continue to print out like covers and splash pages and stuff, you know, potentially in the future, if those are something people would want, there's actually going to be physical copies mm -hmm. of them. Um, but uh, just doing an all digital process and I developed something called the Slack method. Um, and That's it's my favorite method. Yeah, <laughs> not, not the slack off method, but the slack method, uh, the Scott Loss accelerated comic method. Uh, it is who's that name for? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but it's a, basically I work on eight pages at a time, like all at once. So I made a spreadsheet to where the, the page itself is divided up into eight pages. And then so I can thumbnail it all out and then work on another layer, like tightening things up. So um I don't know how it is for all artists, but for me personally, that some days drawing characters is super easy or drawing backgrounds is super easy. Some days backgrounds are super difficult. So on those days, if you're working on one page, instead of just like grinding out the background when you don't feel like working, you have the ability to go to a different page where there's more characters. So, so that say the day that I'm working on characters is just super easy. Uh, I'll just hop to the next page, start working on characters there. So I'll just bang out as many characters as I can, mm -hmm. as opposed to grinding out something that I don't feel like drawing. So with this method, it just constantly keeps me working as opposed to killing, killing hours trying to draw something that I don't want to do. Cool. Now, if you were to like come up with a new idea, like how would you start that process? Uh, for for like a story, for a like particular a story. story. Yeah. So I I collaborate with a writer. Mm -hmm. um, it's someone I know actually from wrestling. We're both wrestlers. We had a lot of same interests like Bruce Lee comics, basketball shoes, and so um, you know I was just talking to him about my book and he was like well I'm a, I like I'm a writer I like writing comics you want to draw my comic and I'm all oh well I'm I, you know I'm not really quick so I can only draw my comic and I read some of his stuff and and so I kind of said hey here's what my characters are about here's their personalities their wants their dreams or whatever put them in a restaurant having a conversation and mm -hmm. like he crushed it and then so that's how we started working together um, so I'll kind of run run stuff by him like well look this is what I want to do I want to I need this story to start here to end here. Um, so figure out how we get there. And then he'll, you know, shoot me over like a rough draft. And usually his rough draft's pretty good. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is really good. I could start working off of this. And then so he'll kind of tighten up and then send me another draft and I'll start thumbnailing. Um, and then we'll just do, you know, sometimes I'll get an idea as we're going, like, this is a good place for a joke. So I'll, <laughs> I'll draw a joke and I'm like, I could totally slip a drawing of a joke in right here. And then we'll, We'll uh, do revisions like after everything is said and done. Like, okay, well, now that there's some new art or a new scene that took place, how can we fit this in? You know, what's said and stuff. So that's that's how our process works. Cool. Um, I know Scott, Emily, and Lee can pretty much draw and I guess write your own stuff. But Travis, I mean, you're a writer. Yep. How, how did you go about finding an artist for your book? Um. So the first time I. Um, the first time I ever commissioned someone to do some pages for for me, I had a um, a story that I I kind of have since not really abandoned, but it's, it's on the back burner. Um, 
I have known Emily for a long time, actually, probably about 12 years now. Um, we used to Yikes. work. We used to, <laughs> we used to work at a school district together doing an after school care program. And uh, we both kind of had this interest in comics and... And monkeys? And <laughs> apes, sir. <laughs> apes. That's our word. <laughs> um, so when I started developing this idea, I knew Emily. I kind of reached out to her and I said, hey, do you know anyone who can do these pages? And she kind of connected me with somebody she really knew. Um, and that was kind of my first lesson in working with an artist and commissioning them and... Um, how you would how you would script script the story and how you would communicate with them, um, and there were some things that that worked really well and some things that were very much a, a learning experience from that. Um, so later on, when I had a full script and I was ready to develop it, I was able to kind of take that knowledge and move forward. And a lot of my artists now, I find um, on Instagram, I find uh, there's a Facebook group called Connecting uh, Comic Book Writers and Artists. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of just put up an ad, and I have people who um, post their portfolios, and I kind of look at that, and I say, okay, I'm, I want to work with somebody, and then we just start having a conversation and see what happens. You know, A lot of times you'll start talking with somebody, and nothing comes of it, and sometimes you get some really great work out of it. Cool. Um, I sort of want to touch on the challenges of sort of being a creative and also balancing real life. So I know Emily, you started freelancing full time. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are some of the challenges that you've you faced uh, since you switched? Um, honestly, a lot of the challenge was uh, was keeping myself um, on a time schedule, like uh, really time management, because that's just a little bit closer. To I've me. always had I've always had a boss. I've always had a manager, and so um, that was the biggest learning experience for me was balancing managing my own time, uh, advertising myself, which is something that very often gets very often gets uh, put to the wayside, especially for introverted artists. Um, it just seems like while they're working, it's a total waste of time to be like, oh, I should stop working so I can make a make an Instagram post, make a Facebook post. Um, it feels very superficial when you're when you're on on like a, a working track. Um, but it's really important because that's you know, there's no point in working and working and working when no one's seeing it, um, because getting seen is how you get work. It's so tough. it's it, and it like that just seems like such a small thing to do. It's, it's like it seems it's like a so small difficult. thing until you have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and until like you then when you see the attention it gets, you're like, oh, I should keep doing that. And it's very <laughs> it's very <laughs> difficult to set aside the time to like to shift from being in your own little world on your art desk to like speaking to the world about your work. <laughs> Well, and that's one of the great things about our studio is that we really kind of push each other and we, we kind of remind each other that's about true. like, you know, hey, don't forget to, to put your stuff out there. And, and when we talk about our methods and, and what we're doing, it's always kind of like a good reminder or a good lesson to each one of us of like, oh, yeah, we should we should be working on that. That's really kind of the power of, of our group. Yeah. And honestly, I don't think I could have made it as far as I did without having the group to keep me motivated, um, to ask me how I'm doing all the time, to exchange ideas with. But um, yeah, that's the biggest challenge for me has been managing my time and managing my uh, my promotions. And cool. she does it. She still does it very well. Like, like I'll check in like I'm the pseudo editor for for the anthologies. Um, basically, I'm kind of keeping track of everybody seeing you know, where they're at and their stories, if there's any issues. And um, she's one of the people I never have to worry about. Like, I'm, she says that, and I'm sure it does help her, mm -hmm. but it's like, at the end of the day, she, I'm like not stressed about it. I'm like, okay, she's gonna get it done. I mean, she knows, but I think, you know, obviously in her mind, she might be <laughs> worried about it, <laughs> but, but thankfully she does not, she does that. not, yeah, she does not worry me. So that's a big help to me. I now Lee, on the other hand, uh, that's uh, a Oh my God, it's yeah. a shit show. <laughs> You're redrawing yeah. the last three pages? Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not worried. Trying to like spit Gandalf into every single yeah. frame. It's like, I see that alien penis in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I know what's really going on. This is a Verizon situation all over again. <laughs> <laughs> um, Speaking of Lee, uh, what are some of the challenges you face as a totally independent uh, creator? Um, I have a teenage child. Um, <laughs> there you so go. It's, it's, uh, it's, I like to work really late at night, but my clients like to call me during the day. And uh, I think that's probably one of the worst things is, uh, like Emily says, you know, time management's always, you know, even with me doing this for 20 years now, it's, it's hard because, uh, especially since I do have a family, 
Uh, I want to spend time with my family. I want to hang out with them and whatnot. And uh, so, but they're awake during certain hours and I would prefer to be unconscious so that I can, <laughs> so that I can work in the evening undisturbed. And so sometimes like uh, I'll get people comment. It's like, you know, holy crap, you're still awake on my Twitch stream. And it's like, no, nah, I'm just working on something I can show you, which means I turn the camera on. Mm. But I'm, you know, three, four a.m. is not an odd thing for me to be awake working in the studio. And then, you know, I don't really sleep. I don't sit down and sleep like six, eight hours like most people. Mm -hmm. It's I'll sit down and sleep like two hours, and then I'll go work, and then I'll wake up, or and then I'll and then I'll wake up for my work. But then I'll uh, then I'll go to bed, you know, like do like a 15, 20 minute power nap, and then I'll go back to work for another four to six hours, and then I'll sleep for like another two hours or something. And so it's, it was strangely that's how they said that people should be doing. They should have two sleep cycles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that's a theory going around that yeah. people should actually have two sleep cycles, which is very interesting to me. Yeah, but I just, I worked, I, for me, it's the secret to my time management is um, working when everybody else is asleep so that they leave me alone. <laughs> so I've got it, like I said, I got a teenage kid, so it's not uncommon for me to be in the zone working, focused on something, and then suddenly I hear the dreaded words, hey, dad, <laughs> and just immediately snaps me out of my groove. How, how long were you streaming the first day of the Kickstarter? Um, well, I streamed twice. Okay. So I streamed, uh, when it went live, I started streaming, I think. And then I did my scheduled, uh, well, I guess technically I scheduled three times. Uh, I streamed three times. So I, st I started streaming in the earlier, or earlier in the day. Then I stopped for like two hours, and that was so I could work on stuff off camera, because I have, you know, right. Disney and whatnot projects I got to work on, which I cannot show on camera. So then I went back, did my scheduled stream, which is my normal schedule is uh, 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Right. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Um, and then, so we did that stream. Uh, I think we went till 11 or 12 that night and then I logged off and then I came back like at two and I went until about 6 AM. <laughs> so, and you were the one who pushed us over the halfway mark that, that first uh, day. I, I was hey, absolutely, like <laughs> I, I, that, that's actually, well, that's, that's why, it, that's kind of the joke is why I have to redo the last three pages. <laughs> was kind of, I had people They're They're like, well, there's this $125 option on the thing. What happens if we do that? It's like, oh, they'll put you in a book next year. And the, but these are people who buy a lot of artwork off me or they're friends of mine. You know, one of them is a former military gentleman named Spartan, uh, the Spartan show on Twitch. Mm -hmm. And then DCD sports is one of my collectors. Uh, so Doug. And so they messaged me and said, well, can we be in your book this year? It's like, well, you can, but I have to redo the last couple pages cause to fit oh. your, put your faces in there. So yeah, that was so. like 250 bucks. <laughs> yeah. So that was like 250 bucks right there in, in that. And then when I think, I, I think a uh, Spartan actually was a little bit more generous. I think he, yeah threw in an extra hundred bucks. Yeah. Which is pretty rare. I think that's like, hey, for your trouble yeah. you know, type <laughs> thing, which is super cool. Um, when you, uh, he mentioned me about it that you, you know, he talked to you and he said that you had room. They're going to, I'm going to put them in this year's book. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, so that's why I was the page, like, oh, that's the pages totally were cool. almost done. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, that was, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Like he has time to put him in there. So now I'm finding out like, no, those pages were done. I'm just going to redo them. <laughs> <laughs> that is a whole bit of new information, but. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then, um, uh, and then towards the end of that stream, as we were coming up on the last like hour or two, uh, you know, people who'd been watching, like they, you know, they would watch the stream, go to bed, wake up. I'm still on. Oh, oh, you're still on. What the hell? <laughs> go to bed, take a nap, you know, go to work, come home. I'm still on. They're like, what the hell? So finally I had, uh, I remember MC Sloth Tech and, um, it was another gentleman. I'm trying to remember who it was, uh, but he would have come. Samir would, uh, Dumek, I believe, is his real name, uh, mm -hmm. would have come up mm -hmm. on the thing. But uh, so mm -hmm. Sam was one of the people who came up, and it's like, you need how much money to go to bed? And so <laughs> he just he just like dumped like fifty or hundred bucks onto the the Kickstarter. He's like, okay, I just supported your Kickstarter. It's over the midway point. Go to bed. <laughs> awesome. And so yeah, it was, like it was it. my fans yeah. basically because I was streaming so long. They it was were just, just like, in yeah. time too. they were like, please yeah. go to bed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're all. Punch drunk, you're all. Oh, I want to finish this page. I should do it, guys. That's really what it was. It was just like you were delirious. And so yeah, I, I'm just. So. I, I have OCD and I refuse to fail. So it's awesome. awesome. Just and yeah. that's why Lee's our our first day MVP. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously you're you're pretty uh, proficient at Twitch. I mean, how long did it take you to get to that point? That's a weird one because. <laughs> um, I first started streaming. Uh, we're actually coming up on my third anniversary of streaming uh, oh, wow. as a partner streamer on Twitch. We've mm -hmm. already passed my third anniversary of starting streaming, which was uh, November. Mm -hmm. um, so three years ago, last November, uh, my friend uh, Brian Small, who's also an artist, um, he was telling me, you know, uh, he knew I had stopped streaming and I was streaming on another service and I hated it because... 
they had commercial breaks that would just run based on how long the viewer was viewing. So if I was talk, going over a technique or if I was doing a class or something like that on stream, and I was like, oh yeah, you have to mix your paints this way because if you don't, something critical would happen. And then right when I talk about the critical part, an ad would hit oh. for a viewer. And they're like, hang on, an ad hit, can you repeat that? So I'd start repeating it. And then somebody else would be, hang on, a another ad hit for me, can you repeat it? And so oh, I'd end geez. up losing wow. so much of, of the momentum of the stream because their the way their service was set up was really stupid. It wouldn't just run an ad universally for everybody at once. It was random for each person. Mm -hmm. And I hated that. And so eventually it just it became so frustrating dealing with just the ads side of it that I just quit streaming. And, uh, uh, and then when my friend Brian was just like, well, why don't you try Twitch? I'm like, well, that's video game guys. He's like, mm -hmm. yeah, but they just, started, they just started creative streaming. So they bought the rights to Bob Ross. Oh, wow. Um, wow. And that's actually kind of where the Bob Ross you know, explosion came from was uh, uh, Amazon owns Twitch. So they bought Twitch a few years ago. But they bought the rights to Bob Ross to air it on Twitch as part of their launch for the creative streamers. Got it. Interesting. And suddenly Bob Ross has like 14, 15,000 things. They get like 40 million viewers a week, something like ridiculous numbers. And they wow. were just like, holy. Because like, suddenly millennials who did not grow up on Bob Ross. Right. Knew who he was. Got hit with him, you know, and whatever they're calling the new generation. <laughs> Everybody born after 2000. But um it's like they're running out of letters. What are they going to do? <laughs> yeah. So Generation Z, uh, Generation AA. Um, but so guys, we're not going to last two more generations. <laughs> <laughs> generation. We don't even have to worry. Sounds like Generation yeah. Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. But um, Generation What the Hell? Is that, that is actually a, it's unfortunate. <laughs> like with the accidental aliens, it's hard for me to just put, you know. The, the initials yeah. in there. Yeah. Oh, it's the accidental aliens. AA. <laughs> oh. -A. oh, crap. The accidental alien anthology. AAA. -A -A. I was like, crap. We're screwed. Yeah. We're AAA. Triple we're double A. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're batteries. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah. So with uh, with Twitch, um, I started. I streamed like once in November, and I was like, okay, well that was cool. And then I streamed like once in December, and was kind of like, okay, that was cool. And then. I streamed in January, I think like two or three times, and then I guess somebody uh, raided me from one of the bigger raids. It was like, oh, holy crap, this guy is like actually doing like oil paintings. At the time of Disney, uh, uh, I, would, I was allowed to actually do some of my Star Wars art on stream. Mm -hmm. So I was doing official Star Wars art, and so people had jumped into the stream, and they're like, holy crap, this guy's actually doing like you know full-blown Star Wars oil paintings. Mm -hmm. And so I got a lot of momentum there. And then in, uh, I went to WonderCon that year, and there was a representative from Twitch, and he's all like, "Hi, you know, I'm, you know, Monkey on Strike." Uh, his Twitch username. He just he introduced himself <laughs> as Monkey. You'd like him, uh, <laughs> but uh, I would enjoy him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass that on. But no, um, it's not what you think. <laughs> it's sexually. Yeah. Oh, oh well, I'll warn him. But um, but yeah. So it, uh, but he's like, you know, have you applied for partnership? And it's like, oh, I don't stream enough or get the audience and stuff for partnership. He's like, just apply. Trust me. And so I applied, and like a week later, I had a subscribe button. So what, is, what does that mean, partnership? I'm not that familiar with Twitch, so I don't know how that works. Um, so uh, if you're partnered with Twitch, um, and they also have a program called Affiliate now, which is cool because partner is hard to get, but uh, Affiliate's actually fairly easy to get. And it's if you're streaming regularly and you start drawing enough of an audience, they'll give you a subscribe button. Mm -hmm. And now people will pay you $5 a month to keep you streaming. Yes, nudge, nudge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to get Emily to stream. Um, but now people are essentially paying five bucks a month and you get half of that. So the it's streaming awesome. service yeah. takes 250, you get 250 and um, you know, per sub. And then if you get over a certain audience or whatever, then they'll partner you. And so oh, you also okay. get the, the subs also get like custom emotes. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one of the things I like to do is uh, I'll periodically do like people who are over two years right now, I have a program going. So if you've been subbed to my channel for more than two years, you're getting original art from me. Oh, so wow. I'm, doing yeah. like, I'm doing like eight by 10 portrits uh, of, awesome. of characters or, f you know, friends, family, people, you know, dogs um, for cool. people who've subbed more than two years. Mm. And uh, so you do it by tiers. So I've watched I've watched some of uh, Jim Lee's on YouTube. I've mm -hmm. never actually I, your your Twitch stream was the first <laughs> Twitch stream I'd ever actually got on. Um, but I'll, I'll like watch Jim Lee's and so yeah, Jim Lee's about, also on Twitch by the way yeah, yeah. you can find him under the word rad. Jim Lee right <laughs> um, so I'll watch some of his on YouTube and, and so his he has tiers do you have tiers like his is like mm -hmm. if you do 20 a month he'll review your portfolio yeah like that type of stuff yes so I have okay. I have three tiers um, and I have a hundred something subscribers right now um, so but I've got like 300,000 viewers 
Oh, sure. So, okay. um, so as far as like the number of people who have come back and checked out the stream, so it's 300,000, but I've only got like a, like a hundred something view, uh, subscribers. We do have a thing like if we ever hit 250, um, Damon Reaper, the guy who, uh, Brian, the guy who talked me into joining Twitch, um, he, myself, Maria, uh, possibly Emily and my, uh, intern Jen, uh, are all talking about dressing up as French maids. <laughs> so we're gonna we'll do a French made themed art stream. That's awesome. And uh, we're gonna try and learn the we're gonna learn some Beyonce songs and I like it. You know, do a, do some like dancing dressed as French maids. Are you also gonna do push-ups? Yeah, I was gonna say yeah, 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 push ups. Yeah, French made <laughs> depend depends on where the camera's placed. Right. Make sure, yeah, make sure yeah, oh, that's so strategically. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly, exactly where it's is when I get forward. subs. Uh, I was in the Marine Corps, so when I get subs That's something you won't get on Jim Lee's Twitch. Right. <laughs> right. When somebody subscribes to my channel, I drop and do push ups. And it's not uncommon for one of my tier three subs guys we were talking about this the other day uh, with, I think it was, I forgot with one of you guys but um or on the panel actually uh, but one of my subs is a tier three which is uh, 25 push-ups for me and um, but if somebody he'll come in and I give 15 push-ups if you do a, uh, a gifted sub so he'll gift like four or he'll gift like five tier one sub subs which is 75 push-ups then he'll resub which is 25 and he's like, okay <laughs> start sweating monkey boy wow. and That's so you know and then, funny. Yeah, and then so. just destroys your arms from drawing i don't even know how you can pick up a brush after that and i think a lot of push-ups yeah. i think there's a, i think if you have an amazon prime account i think you're gifted like a twitch you yeah Am amazon account. prime users you get one free sub a month mm. um it does not renew automatically you have to manually go back and renew it um so if you sub to me or whatever or anybody else after a month, it'll just say, hey, your Twitch Prime's available again. It doesn't mm -hmm. renew for that person. Yeah. Um, so if you do find somebody you want to resub to, you just have to keep clicking that. Um, but cool. you also get, there's also lots of benefits. Like you get, uh, like I get free games and there's like perks, like my uh, account is actually tied to my Blizzard account. So oh, sometimes okay. I'll get like skins and stuff and Overwatch or other games. Emily, I think this is a painting a very positive picture for you to oh twitch is amazing it, and, it's, and the cool thing <laughs> yeah. is so what really the really cool thing i love about twitch personally is when youtube started demonetizing people and they started saying well your audience isn't cool enough well some of the affiliates only need like 12 people you know an audience of 12 oh, yeah. to become affiliated if you have like 12 people regularly you're an affiliate they can you can apply for affiliate status when you get it um a lot of these people who are on youtube doing stuff are now they're jumping over to Twitch mm -hmm. and they're doing stuff on Twitch because now they can monetize on Twitch whereas their audience wasn't big enough to monetize on YouTube. I see. And you can still save videos and you can clip and you can edit your stuff and upload it. And you can also do premieres so you can record something in advance and then stream it later Oh, as oh, a, that's as a very premiere. Cool. So there's lots of cool right things on. you can do on Twitch. So it's, to me, it's, it's a great alternative to YouTube as far, uh, but it's also mostly live. Oh, okay. Which cool. is cool. And That's awesome. I mean, Twitch isn't going anywhere. I mean, they're owned by Amazon. They're which, owned by Amazon. Yeah. They have the biggest, well, the Amazon web services, so mm -hmm. they have their own web servers to host everything. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, I've never had downtime on Twitch. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, cool. Let's turn the conversation back to the accidental aliens. I know your tagline is, uh, creators are better together. I know Emily touched on some of the, uh, the positives about that. Uh, maybe, as long as we shower. <laughs> no, it's better if we shower together. <laughs> right, that was the word That's she forgot in the tagline. <laughs> right. yeah. So uh, artists are better when they shower together. So uh, Scott, uh, what, you want to add anything else to that? N no, I think it's uh, well. I guess I do. Uh, we have we have a guy in our, our group, uh, Tristan, and I call him my tree. Uh, and I've done this story quite a few times recently. It's like he's so so productive, like overly productive. Like I I really relate to the. The, the saying like if you want something done give it to a busy man and Tristan is one of the busiest people I ever met but he's constantly getting work out he's constantly uh, doing more and more art and I love it and so I refer him to him as, as my tree because it's like when you go running and you I'm not a great runner and I get tired very easily so I will do little goals for myself I'm like okay I'm gonna run to that tree over there and then once you get to the tree you could slow down you could walk or whatever until you find your next object so but tristan is my tree that i'm constantly running to except for he has legs and then so he's running and so it's like i want to catch one day i want to catch him with productivity um but he's just so prolific it's it's going to be insane to do but yeah. uh lee is lee's going to be the other one like <laughs> you know it's it's nice to see like so when you pass one tree and you're like i'm still feeling good oh wait there's, yeah, yeah yeah there's lee right, right. with tree i'm gonna run yeah. to him so, uh, but no, yeah. So, uh, to your question specifically, it's, it's motivational. Like for me personally, like I love, um, 
kind of challenging myself, you know, like it, it, it helps me, you know, you always want to uh, look at artists who are better than you and, you know, doing something that you're not doing. And I, with this group, there's a lot of that. Like Emily is really great at watercolor. And so like I was doing a watercolor piece uh, a little while ago and I was hitting her up. I'm like, what do you think? And, and she's like, oh, it looks good. You know, you might want to think about this or whatever. So it's nice to be able to bounce um, ideas or just work that you're doing at in the moment. Like, what do you think of this? And they'll give you a different perspective on it. Or they'll be like, it looks good. Like, like, cause I was really doubting the watercolor piece I was doing. And I'm like, it looks like crap. And she's like, dude, it looks really good. I don't know what you're talking about. And then I saw it recently. I'm like, Oh crap, those rocks look really great. <laughs> so, you know, in the moment uh, as, as artists, you the rocks look amazing. They were supposed to be Smurfs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was supposed to be stone cold. It was rock the whole time. Uh, that was weird. Uh, so, yeah, so no, it's great uh, being able to bounce bounce ideas and just kind of getting feedback, like instantaneous feedback from each other. Like it's it's very helpful. And when you're just doing it on your own, you don't really have that. Or if you're not surrounded by other artists, they, uh, you know, a regular person doesn't know necessarily what they're looking at. What they're oh, it looks great. You know, your, your mom can tell you you're a great artist all you want, but it's doesn't make it to be true. Yeah. So. And art can be a really solitary job, so it really helps to, you know, it really helps to to uh, be a community so that when you start getting to the really, really solitary parts of it, you can reach out to people and be like, hey, I need some new perspective. I need something. I need someone to, to help me with this. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Uh, no, I was going to say, like, as a writer, um, we have... Uh, I have access to a lot of resources here. You know, Scott mentioned earlier that he had helped me with character designs. Um, I can I can bounce ideas off Emily. Like she does a lot of titles and and logo work that that she helps me out with. Uh, like with Tristan, Tristan's a great letterer. So I have all these different resources um, that I that I don't have access to as myself as as just the writer. You know, per se. So. Cool. Uh, Lee, you want to add anything else to that? Uh, nah, they did great. <laughs> <laughs> There's Lee not pulling his weight again. <laughs> I guess we'll do a quick thunder round because what would a holiday show be without a thunder round, right? <laughs> so, uh, this will start with Scott. Okay. If you were a creature or monster, what kind of creature or monster would you be and why did you pick that? Oh, what? I, <laughs> <laughs> I already have my answer ready to go. Go, for go this, ahead. Man. Go ahead, please. I my, know that kind of defeats the. Lightning round or whatever. <laughs> now, I'm going to go with um, the Wolfman, specifically the, the Universal Wolfman, because that's just one of my favorite all-time not, movies. Not, not Teen Wolf? No, no. <laughs> and Lon Chaney Jr. over Michael J. Fox. What, what can I say? Um, that is just one of the most impressive movies to me still, whether it's the, the sound design or the costume design or the, even the performances. Cool. We'll, we'll give Scott a chance. No, I, okay. No, because this is cheating. I shouldn't have, like, it's supposed to be, like, super quick. The The first thing that entered my mind was uh, some kind of, like, like aqua uh, situation, some kind of creature from the, you know, Black Lagoon. God damn it. Oh, was that, right? <laughs> nope. that was just the first thing that entered my mind. I'm like, oh, it would be cool to... It'd be cool to breathe underwater because I know the answer to superpower. I know that answer like right away. And I was like, oh, I've never thought about being a monster before, but it'd be cool to breathe underwater. Yeah. I'm, I, the first uh, anthology story I ever did was a sea creature story that Travis wrote. And then when I wanted to venture out and write my own story the next year, I just kind of defaulted on a sea creature story again. And so I think that's just something that really appeals to me. I love, uh, I love Creature of the Black Lagoon. I actually, based my second story off of the sequel, Revenge of the Creature, even though that was terrible. But <laughs> I wanted to make something very, very loosely based on that, on, uh, on a sea creature being put into like an artificial uh, containment situation. Uh, I would probably be some kind of like multi-limbed creature that like se secreted glue so I can like climb walls and stuff like that or help people like build model kits. I thought you were going to say you want multiple limbs so you could do more work. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I thought I was saying. I could definitely do No, I'm, I'm, I'm more along the lines of it's like, well, here, let me help you like, you know, restucco your house. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to think of flying things, but I was like, I don't want to be like the fly. That's gross. You could be Mothra. Oh, yeah, that's even that's even worse. Yeah. Can you imagine a, a kaiju with multiple <laughs> arms so he yeah. can work a lot and help people? True. Yeah. Well, but, but then little lady worshippers, though. Exactly. That's what I was gonna say. I was like, shape of water, kind of like. I was like, well, yeah, you know, there's still something there. 
<laughs> you can still get it even though you're a monster. Right. <laughs> Grinding right. emo. If, um, nice. What's uh, one thing that your fans would be surprised to know about you? Apparently how much I enjoy apes. <laughs> <laughs> Sexually. <laughs> Emily. Um, do I have fans? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, um, uh, I don't think anything about me would surprise my fans. <laughs> I'm very, <laughs> I, just, I just work a lot. Like, I, I kind of bare my soul on my Instagram, so uh, I, try, um, I try not to have too many surprises. <laughs> How about, what about, uh, what's the Zelda game, the Breath of the Wild? The, That's not oh, a surprise. That doesn't, yeah, there's like, yeah. a there's, like, there's Zelda, so much Breath of the Wild, Breath of the Wild fan art on my Instagram. That's, <laughs> you know. How about this? You used to work with kids. Um, yeah, that would surprise some people because I'm an awful person. <laughs> but, you know, people change. <laughs> um, it's actually a weird thing is uh, for some reason, every time I tell people or, you know, like Veterans Day or whatever, I'll post a picture of me from the Marine Corps or something like that. And I'll just get flooded by people who've known me for years going, you were a Marine. <laughs> like, it's just, yeah, I was in the U.S. Marine Corps. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't why? Know that. I didn't know that about you until you told me. Like, was that a couple weeks ago? You had mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's. Yeah. I mean, I, I've done lots of work for the Marine Corps uh, as a professional too, as an artist, and mm-hmm. it was just so just, to me. I did like 32 murals at Camp Pendleton, so mm-hmm. oh. it was one of these things where it's like, why? You know, to me, it's like, why is it such a surprise to people? I've never kept it a secret or anything, but it's like, <laughs> yeah, I was in the Marine Corps. How did that work? It's like, do you ever wonder why I can why I can do so many push-ups? <laughs> <laughs> I pissed off a lot of sergeants. <laughs> Scott, I uh, I think half of the fan base doesn't know I used to be a pro wrestler, but the other half does. So so probably not that. Um, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm very uh, open as well about like my life, my interests, sexuality, sexuality. <laughs> we probably don't know that you're half Filipino, right? Yeah, most I, that, yeah, that's actually part of my pitch is if I um, uh, see Filipino fans, I go, hey, Filipino? And then, like, cause, cause sometimes you got to ask, because like, I did it one time, I assumed, and he goes, uh, he's like, I'm not ocean. I was just like, oh, sh- sh- my bad, dude. Because like, he seemed mad about it. And I was like, he must get that a lot. And then so I always, I always clear that hurdle first. So I always make sure. And then I'll go into the, the, you know, the Filipino characters in my books and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and Lanil you just designed the new one. Yeah, wave. I don't know jobs. Like I never talk about work outside drawing or when I was wrestling. I never talked about it. Um, so yeah, uh, I, don't know. I was a dispatcher. I guess that would be something no one knows about me. So I had zip codes memorized in in San Diego. <laughs> oh, like dispatcher, like assassin. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also what he does that. now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He works, like for the government. Government. <laughs> he works for the government. That's the secret government gotcha. job he has. He's like the fixer for the government. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess the last question for Thunder Round would be uh, congratulations once again on the Kickstarter. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, it's funded. Now it's time for stretch goals. Yes. yes. Yeah. So that'll be uh, extra pages, the upgraded cover, um, and then we'll go from there. You know, maybe we'll do, depending where we go, um, get some bookmarks or something like that, stuff that people like. Scratch and sniff cover. (laughs) (laughs) For a creature feature? Right. It's going to smell like her dog. Yeah. (laughs) So for the last question, um, your Kickstarter goal for this year was uh, $3,500. If I were to give you each $3,500, what would you do with it? I would pay off my credit card, (laughs) which is slightly over (laughs) $3,500. Is a very boring answer. That's what I would do, too. (laughs) But uh, I'm... So I have a... I have a, I get addicted to things, obsessed with things. Like one year it was Pokemon Go. Oh, I guess that would be something people don't know. Oh, hey, yeah. we should be friends because I, <laughs> I play too. Well, I was. I, oh. I, but uh, so once, like, I will stop doing it because I can't play video games because I get addicted to them. And then so I got addicted to Pokemon Go for uh, a year. And it was the most unproductive year, unproductive year I ever had in my entire life. So I deleted I got everything. I got like three of everything. Uh-huh. And so I deleted it off my phone. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. And then um, last year I got addicted to um, Pops or oh. a year ago. So I had. Yeah, you swatch your videos. Yeah, I got, <laughs> I got 300 of them. And, and I was just like, what am I doing with my life? I like yeah. racked up a huge that, credit that's, card. That's one debt. thing. That's one thing I don't want to ever get started in is buying Funko Pops. Yeah, it's it's really it's bad. It's oh, like, I know what I'm getting you for your. Uh, for <laughs> yeah, yeah. My very, you get one. Yeah, my very first Fun- Funko Pops were the Planet of the Apes. Oh. So my buddy knew I love Planet of the Apes, and uh, so and then I was so like, now I'm purging that. But then I got addicted to buying 
uh, old comics. So I actually got addicted to buying, I'm like, I'm going to own the first 20 X-Men comics. Oh, yeah. I remember you, t- you tell me about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, this year I'm addicted to streamlining. So like I'm going through my house and streamlining everything, getting rid of things. So it's like I'm selling a lot of my pops and stuff in order to pay this credit card debt off. So, ah. Yeah. Well, uh, 3500 I don't have quite that much uh, credit card debt, but um, honestly, I would just uh, keep doing what I'm doing. That's basically what I started with when I quit my, um, my graphic design job. Um, no, there was a little more than that, but, you know, I had some money saved up, and it was at a point at my job where I said, you know, it's really time for me to stop saying no to art jobs and to uh, say no to my day job and just, like, sit down and focus. And that's when I really battled my, my time management <laughs> issues but you know it really it really was a great jumping off point i'm so glad i did it um and so uh yeah that's what i would do with that just uh keep on plugging away and making sure i can uh pay my bills travis uh with thirty five hundred dollars i would just make more comics it would just go right back into my next issue my next project um that's really what i want to focus on and doing is just getting more of my stories out there cool lee um I would thirty five hundred. I'm trying to figure out if thirty five hundred is enough to, for me to buy like year long passes to Disneyland for my family. <laughs> so, just just barely. Yeah, yeah I, would, I, would, I would do that. It probably is just barely. Yeah, if, would, if not enough. I, I would. I would probably buy uh, definitely me and my kid at least. But uh, I'd love to get one for my wife also. But <laughs> she can stay yeah. home. Well, you get the well, kid it, go. It, yeah. I don't want to do that. But uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, I would totally. You know, I would see what I could do to upgrade that amount of money so I could get all three of us. So it's like I'll do more paintings. <laughs> upgrade you to oil painting. <laughs> Um, you, you guys uh, mentioned stretch goals earlier since you guys uh, have uh, success, successfully uh, gotten your um, your Kickstarter funded. Um, are there any stretch goals that you sort of want to highlight? I would just say the, the upgraded cover is, mm-hmm. is number one. Mm-hmm. And then after that, uh, if we wanted to add pages, we could do that as well. So uh, the previous years, we did a sketch page in between stories because we would have six pages of story and one sketch page. Um, this year, we're actually doing seven pages of story and just eliminating that sketch page. So what we'd probably add would be the sketches to the back of the book um, if, if that was something that we hit. Um, and then that would be after a certain amount. Um, a lot of times what we'll do with money that's raised over our initial goal is we'll put that towards... Coke uh, and horse? Oh, yes. <laughs> <Sorry. Well>, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's where I was going for and, sure. Yeah. And, and apes. Yes. <laughs> uh, Hollywood, baby. <laughs> yeah. A horse dressed in ape costumes <laughs> for Travis. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it would go toward, so about $600, it would go to, to a table for a small press table at San Diego mm-hmm. Comic-Con. Mm-hmm. And that's what we did last year. Uh, instead of us getting like a small bit of money that really wouldn't do much for uh, you personally, um, we just let, left it in studio. And then that way we were able to all make money in the future at the next year's convention by selling our wares at San Diego Comic-Con on a bigger platform. Yeah. Um, so the small term goal would be, oh, you get 150 bucks or something. But then if the studio holds it, we could potentially print more books throughout the year. Not, not the anthology, but like other titles released by the accidental aliens and then also have a booth for San Diego Comic-Con. And then, so those are, those are kind of like, there's, we have our, we have our immediate goal. And then about at 5,000, um, is when we start doing the stretch goals because that buffer for one, we need it towards printing costs of a lot of our rewards. Um, our minimum goal is usually aimed at how much it would cost to print the books. And then, so once we get that, that's when the extra money kind of covers everything else. Kickstarter does this weird thing too, where they include the um, shipping money into your total goal. So that's where the number's false. Mm-hmm. Like if it was 3,500, um, what we raised plus the, the, you know, on the side is the shipping, then it would be fine. But unfortunately our goal right now, that includes the shipping and that's not what our initial numbers were mm-hmm. looking at. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I'm curious, since you all have your individual uh, IPs and, and properties, mm-hmm. um, what has the sort of uh, accept, acceptance and support have been for, for like, you know, from your personal text and aliens, have they sort of like uh, uh, supported the, the aliens projects? It's just like people in our family and stuff. Well, like I'm that. talking about like people who, who usually buy your, your individual comic books. Oh. Do they usually gravitate toward the anthology also? Um, um, 
for I try with mine, like I said, I talked about. Um, I try to make some kind of crossover in there. Um, so, like I said, I my my audiences are usually people with disabilities or limb differences. So my my anthology story last year had a character who who was missing an arm and was an amputee. So I try to make that kind of crossover. Um, but usually the people who are, are willing to support uh, Unstoppable Cherub and me are, are more than, than happy to help out with anthologies and that kind of stuff, too. Mm, cool. Anybody else want to add? Um, I'll just flat out say, yeah, just because uh, doing the streams in the Kickstarter, I've had so many people who I have known for you know three years now on my stream chime in saying they're buying the Kickstarter, so or they join the Kickstarter. So, That's awesome. Nice. So it definitely, it definitely works <laughs> as yeah. far as, like, the audience crossover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, is there like sort of like a strategy that you sort of plan out in terms of like getting the word out beforehand? Um, yes. <laughs> I, I, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, I, I remember before my first Kickstarter, I, I just read up on it because I didn't know anyone that had done one. Uh, no, no, I take that back. I knew one guy. Um, his, his was uh, aimed kind of at uh, an adult audience. <laughs> so he got funded pretty quickly. Uh, so... So I was just like, I need to do some research. I need to figure out how to run a successful Kickstarter. And um, so I read some articles, and, and there was one that had a lot of great, helpful tips. And uh, so I implemented those in my first uh, three Kickstarters. So by the time we got to the anthology, I was like kind of like a seasoned vet of the Kickstarter scene. I'm like, okay, this is how we got to do it. Make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're doing this. Mm -hmm. And um, so that helped others who hadn't had... Uh, a story published yet or worked on Kickstarter to, to kind of get a vibe of what we're going to run into while while doing it. One thing that we run into on Kickstarter is there's like a middle of the month lull. Mm -hmm. So the first week is hot, the middle two weeks are a little slow, and then the last week is hot. And I'm like, and that's just how it's always been mm -hmm. that I've noticed. So um, this year's this year's been a little different, though. This, mm -hmm. this is the first time, and this is my fifth one. It's because we have constant advertising on Twitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll stop. <laughs> Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> um, so yeah, this year's been slightly different. So it's 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 definitely cool that mm -hmm. you know. That's awesome to get more throughout the year mm -hmm. or throughout the month. Um, yeah. One I thing. Gonna, oh, on I'll go ahead, though. I was going to say um, so. Uh, this is actually uh, the third Kickstarter that I've been like really closely involved with. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first one was actually a tech Kickstarter for mm -hmm. a company called XY Findables, uh, which created uh, like Bluetooth tracking devices. And so they raised almost a quarter of a million dollars. Jeez. And so wow. it was that was an amazing Kickstarter. Did really well. Um, and uh, but it was also kind of funny because it's uh, the Kickstarter was seed money for a company that's now XYO. And they're doing amazing stuff. Uh, they just partnered, I think, with Microsoft, too. So, uh, But that was a company I helped found. Um, and then I left that company to go back to doing movies and stuff full time. But uh, uh, a branch off of that company was another group called Webble. We were trying to use the GPS and location tracking to create a, a technology where if you walked into a convention center, mm. and uh, everybody had, like, Wolf Protasio had, we gave him a, uh, a Bluetooth device that essentially he would take it to conventions and set it on his table and if somebody if he and I were at the same conventions and somebody was a huge Wolf Protasio fan if they hit my beacon if they walked by my booth and their phone picked up detected my beacon it would let them know he was also in that same building so and it would, and it would give him his location and if the convention coordinated with us he could do things like spit out a schedule of like this would be your your most opt to get all the stuff you're interested in here's your most optimal thing and then if everybody's using the app on their phone it can give you like almost a real-time traffic report of the convention hall so it was a really cool system. Unfortunately, nobody wanted to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the ways we were promoting it was we were working with cosplayers. So we did a uh, uh, we did a cosplay trading card thing called Cospaint, where we would actually we had cosplayers. We'd make trading cards of them, but then we actually body painted um, some fairly named cosplayers and like Leanna Vamp and uh, mm -hmm. Jesse Pridemore. We would actually body paint them as characters uh, from. Uh, uh, Aspen comics in this particular one. Mm -hmm. And so what we ended up doing is the, uh, we did the, uh, we body painted the costumes on them, photoshopped them so that they were appropriate for all audiences mm -hmm. and stuff. And then those were the chase <laughs> cards. And, uh, but we had a Kickstarter for that and that one actually failed. Um, and it was interesting because uh, it was the same people running the tech uh, and essentially we had a company help run the tech one. And then uh, one of the guys at the company uh, at XY was like, oh, well I've, you know, I saw everything they did. I can do this. 
And then I saw all the mistakes he made doing the second one, which was the big one was, of course, jumping the gun. He launched the thing before we actually had artwork done. Mm -hmm. wow. And so we didn't have any art or visual stuff to support it. And so we had like four images that I'd created. And that was really all we had to show people. And then it was constantly bugging me, like, we need more art, we need more art, we need more art. And it's like, well, it takes time. Yeah, so, right. um, so I think kind of being able to see from the, you know, working on various Kickstarters from various areas, you always, you, see, you start learning things like make sure you've got all your stuff done ahead of time mm -hmm. before you launch the Kickstarter. Try to have your stretch goals and stuff planned out before you're funded. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so that when you actually hit these things, then you can start doing announcements and updates and things like that. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of cool to be able to sit back and then uh, eventually my, my personal goal is eventually I'll do a Kickstarter for a project I'm working on. But, uh, uh, so it's kind of cool to actually see the way that Scott runs this one, mm -hmm. and uh, it's nice to actually see it. Cool. That's that's something we'd actually make sure of too, and we put that in our Kickstarter. Is the art's done? The art is done, or it is ninety five percent done. Unless so, you make Lee redo. <laughs> unless Lee just starts <laughs> telling people he'll put them in his last few pages. Um, <laughs> little slow bat. I see slow bat. Okay. <laughs> oh. So okay. this is this is slow for him. Okay, we'll this one. Oh sure. Yeah. Oh, so you're okay. Uh, yeah, so that's something we do with our Kickstarter is we let people know that you will get this product. It is 95% done. If most not most of the stories are 100% done. Um, and so when it comes to like concerns, like there's a section for concerns, like what concerns might you run into with this project? The only thing that we've run into is uh, other like when we're doing the rewards. Uh, if if donators don't come back and tell us our t-shirt the t-shirt size we don't know what we can't get order the t-shirts until you give us your t-shirt size mm -hmm. or if you have backed a, a tier that has metal prints and you don't get back to us we don't know what metal print to order for you so we can't put the order in until you give us your metal print put a disclaimer in there that says like let us know or you're gonna get this yeah. right right and <laughs> so and then also um the companies for instance like uh, the metal print company when we put the order in it was their busy season so we were backlogged uh, because it was their busy time of year. Yeah. So we waited a lot long. Luckily, um, I like to make sure that the time frame on the Kickstarter gives us more than enough time. So for instance, it says your Kickstarter rewards will be delivered by August 2019 for us. And our, our Kickstarter ends uh, April 1st. Mm -hmm. So that gives us a good amount of time to make sure we get all of the product back before we send it to you. So you might get it within a month, you know, especially if you just wanted the book. You, as soon as we get it from the printer, um, you know, we'll do our packing party and stuff. We're all just like, if we don't have all of the the t-shirts and etc., I'll do the ones that are just the books. I'll just do it on my own. I'll be like, okay, let me just start this, and I'll start packing them myself and just sending those out. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll turn know. my studio into a sweatshop. We can do it on Twitch. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and last year we did we did the packing party at Travis's house, and and that worked out really well. And it's cool. We get to you know have some beers, eat some pizza, and and pack some books, and you know send rewards out. You'll, you'll have to get some coffee this time because Lee doesn't drink. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. true, yeah. true. We'll get something for him. I'm, I'm, I'm a big tea aficionado. I'll, I'll give you, yeah. I'll get you some kombucha or something like uh, that. Yeah, I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good call. I only have alcoholic kombucha. <laughs> well, I think by virtue it is sort of alcoholic. Uh, so some of the kombucha, Festering at least. <laughs> yeah, it's like like of the slightest of slight, like certain ones, but you can get some that are just straight up have some booze in it. Cool. Well, it's been a pleasure having you guys on the show. Um, is there anything else that you'd want to add to the Kickstarter or to the anthology? Um, yeah. Talk about your upcoming project? project? Yeah, I do have an upcoming project. So the reason that I wasn't in um, this year's anthology is that I am launching my own Kickstarter on April 1st. It's called Super Abled Comics. It's an anthology all about disabled or limb different superheroes, and it's from disabled or limb different creators. Nice. Um, so that... That is launching on April 1st. I think you and I are going to have a sit down yep. sometime coming up and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll talk about that more. Um, and how did you find these other creators? Was it through the Lucky Finn? Or? Yeah, so um, there is an organization called the Lucky Finn Project that is all about promoting individuals with limb difference and educating and spreading the word. And um, I was able to contact the um, founder um, and I got involved with them and I last july the week before comic-con i i went out to their annual event it's called lfp weekend and i got to meet all these other people i met um uh limb different actors models musicians um you know writers artists and i saw how talented all these people are i said hey 
why don't we team up? We don't necessarily have the best representation in comics right now. Let's make that representation. And everyone was really on board and excited. And um, we were at the stage where I, you know, I have most of my artwork back. Um, all my team is working very, very hard. They're working very, very efficiently. And we're we're getting ready to launch the launch the Kickstarter. Cool. I look forward to that conversation. Yeah. Cool. Um, I was going to say uh, I have a project I'm working on right now that's uh, the the like a 66 page graphic novel. Oh wow. Um, that's actually by the producer of uh, Nightbreed. The director's cut. Oh, um, nice. So, but we're uh, we just signed the contracts on that. So we're that'll be coming out uh, in the next few months. I'll be releasing artwork and stuff from that as well. Cool. Nice. I'd love to talk to you about that too. Your no All right. And uh, this our Kickstarter ends uh, April first. So April first at noon. So if you haven't backed a project yet, um, go to Kickstarter.com, search "Accidental Aliens," or love if you us. go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or if you go on uh, Instagram, you could find us there, and we have a link in there as well as on our Twitter. Uh, most of us have it in our uh, links mm -hmm. section in our bios, so you can find it on any one of our stuff. If you go to accidentalaliens.com, you can find all of our social media there. Um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff, mm -hmm. and personal websites. As well as the Kickstarter link right at the top. Awesome. Well, thanks again for uh, being on the show, and congratulations on your Kickstarter. And Thank thanks you. to you, man. You've thanks. always like helped out our studio, and you've always supported all the independents and come to all of our events. I remember the first free comic book day I met you. you. You picked up our book without any kind of hesitation, and you really wanted to help us out and support us. So it's my thanks, pleasure. Aaron. Thank you so yes. much. Yeah. Shout out to Alex. He's not here today. He's at a, a arcade uh, convention. Uh, Shout out. So. Uh, Got a friend, uh, Oliver Bione, here helping out on the. Thanks, on Oliver. Thanks, Oliver. So Complaining about battery levels. <laughs> <laughs> and a uh, shout out to Bo for letting us use a coffee shop here, Altered Ego uh, Coffee, here at the uh, SoCal Comics. Uh, Claremont Mason. That's right. Uh, San Diego. 92111. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, that's the show. Uh, peace, cheers, and uh, talk to you later. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Sweet. Thanks, dude. Thanks.